So let's focus on how our industry can action to address the various issues highlighted by the pandemic. Once again, the idea is to offer you a practical, technical, concrete, and operational answers to lead your business. So in the next 40 minutes, we're going to hear feedbacks and share experiences from a panel of experts. I remember, don't forget to prepare your questions via Slido. Uh, I call to the stage our moderator, uh, Courtney Finger, Editor-in-Chief for FTI NS Media Group, Paul Jäger, Managing Director of Russell Reynolds Associates, Olivier Estev, qui est Deputy CIO, CEO pardonnez-moi, pour Covivio, Laurent Jacquemin, Head of Asia Pacific Real Assets for AXA, I am Real Assets, and Gregory Lancher, Chief Development and Construction Officer for the Club Med. So, Courtney, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and you, you've did, done me a favor of introducing my panelists to you so I don't have to mispronounce their uh, French surnames, which is a, a, a challenge that I always have as an American. But welcome to the panelists, and welcome to you. Thank you for joining us here. It's extremely exciting to be in a live event um, after all of these months, and I'm enjoying it so far. I trust you are. Now, as you've seen, the, the subject of our panel today is addressing tomorrow's challenges. Now, we have enough challenges even today in the current state of the world, uh, more than we could discuss in, in 45 minutes. Um, but what we'll do is try to break down a little bit what are the key challenges that the market is facing at the moment. Many of them, you can guess at what they are. But more importantly, we'll talk about how they can be addressed, what the leaders of the industry can do, and how we can move forward, and then try to uh, inject some optimism in terms of looking at what opportunities can be found amidst all of the challenges. So I would like to ask uh, Paul first, um, who leads the financial services practice in France and the real estate practice in Europe for Russell Reynolds Associates, an executive search firm. Um, how are leaders in the industry, you're dealing with quite high level executives as, as part of your role. So what is the sort of reactions from the leaders of the industry um, and, and what are you hearing from them? Um, thank you. I would say that the first uh, lesson we have that leaders in the industry are taking this opportunity of this crisis to really understand what uh, these moments uh, can reveal about the leaders. It's a good opportunity to, to see more clarity in the leadership of the teams. The second uh, experience we see is that leaders currently are playing not only defensive, but also offensive. And we see something very specific there. The third uh, element is probably around the necessity to have new leaders looking outward and being able to really show the, the future to the others. That is really something we can see at the very moment. The last uh, um, element that we can definitely see in the specific uh, circumstances is about the values and the fact that leaders are demonstrating uh, values regarding courage, perseverance, and resilience. That these are definitely the main element that we can see in this specific period. And I guess there's a big implication for talent and workforce around the world with a lot of talk of working from home and, and what it means. Um, in, in your experience, is this overblown? Or do we see a kind of global uh, shakeup in terms of where talent is located? Definitely. And I think it's a good opportunity for the top leaders to redeploy the leaders of their organization in new areas. and take the opportunity to change the perimeters and give new territories to the leaders and especially to the rising leaders. That's a great opportunity, a great moment to give new challenges to the new generation of leaders, definitely, but also for the old generation to take the opportunity to let the new generation, let's say, uh, raise and, and, and shine some, some like, like stars. You know, that's a, a very important moment now. Thank you. So seed way for the, for the new generation to help find some of the solutions to the problems, I think. Definitely. I would also just uh, put some emphasis on the fact that for us in the future, the organization who will be definitely winning are those who will definitely 
take this advantage currently to invest on the future leaders. This is really, so everybody can think that this period will be an opportunity to acquire a talents very easily. That will not be the case. Mm -hmm. I think we must think about that. Uh, most of the current leaders will not move easily, and I think the organization who have a specific view on that, on the, on the, the strategy for acquire new talents, mm -hmm. will be making a big difference. So my recommendation is definitely to think about that, and if we say who will be the winners in one year, mm -hmm. the winners will be those who will be able to start a new strategy to acquire the new generation of leaders. Thank you very much. Now, Olivier is in one of these leadership positions as a deputy CEO at an investment and development company. So how are you preparing the company and your workforce and, and, and helping support recovery of the market? No small job there. <laughs> no small job, I have to say. Uh, and I share totally the point of Paul about uh, leadership and uh, the opportunity of the crisis on that topic. Um, so for us, uh, what, what can we say about the crisis? Our feeling is uh, um, it just reinforced and accelerates some trends uh, which were already, uh, uh, I would say, present in, uh, in our world, and especially the, the, the needs of flexibility, uh, the digitalization of organization, uh, the needs for services. And for us, tomorrow, real estate, and especially offices, uh, have to tackle uh, the, the question of, of course, always location, but also this, uh, this new flexibility is not only flexibility in the, in the workspace, but also flexibility in the contract. So it's a really a, a complete approach. And uh, of course, sustainability and a new, maybe a new topics emerging is about care. Uh, we had the well-being and now we have also all those questions around uh, uh, what, uh, what happens with the pandemic and what could happen in the, in the future. Um, the, 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 the main issue today, if I look at uh, the, the, the different asset class where, where we are involved, uh, I will come back on hotel. And, but for offices, the main question is about this question of remote working and what could happen uh, tomorrow. For us, there is a, a positive outcome uh, because our feeling is that office building will become more and more strategic for, uh, for, the, for the organization, for corporation, uh, because it's a, it's a way to embody the, 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 the company culture uh, to reinforce uh, team efficiency, uh, to, um, to improve creativity, serendipity, and it will become a, a key point also to attract talents. And, uh, and for us, a company is a social organization. We are human beings. We need to, to work together. And, uh, and for us, it's the one a very positive output. And uh, I, I just mean that uh, after the lockdown, it was really impressive to see the team uh, coming back at the office and how they were happy to work again together and, uh, and after on the terrace, uh, after work uh, was uh, really impressive. For us as investors, it changed a little bit the approach. Uh, two years ago, the motto was uh, real estate industry uh, shifting from uh, uh, financial to services. We are definitely in an era of services, but it doesn't mean not only services in the building, uh, but it, it, it means a, a really a complete approach and to be able to, to provide our clients, our stakeholder, tailor-made solution. And it means that in our company, we have to create new field of expertise. We have to attract talent leaders to be able to, to bring what we can bring to the, of course, to the client, but also to the cities uh, and to, uh, I would say, uh, the society. Um, uh, and uh, for uh, the, the last question was about what could happen in one year, and uh, I'm not a crystal ball for sure. Huh? Uh, we have a huge challenge in front of us, but uh, uh, maybe a, a negative point is about the, the size of the market in terms of offices, because what I mentioned probably will push a decrease of the volume, but it means that to, to, to play a major role in that game, we have to be able to provide, I would say, it's uh, of course obvious, but best building with the best location, the best combo of services, and, uh, and companies are more and more uh, thinking about a combo of remote working, offices, flexible solution, and we are able to do that. And uh, to be more positive, I would say it's also an opportunity because uh, to, to rebase our hypothesis, for example, with location, and for, maybe it's an opportunity for the Grand Paris, for example, uh, because when you look at this, uh, this fantastic project, 
we were also uh, a little bit constrained by the idea that we have to be more central, to have large business district. Maybe tomorrow, if you work two, two days from your home, the question of commuting is not the same. And uh, so maybe it's an opportunity also to, uh, to, to look differently the development of the, the, all the country and especially the, the great par greater Paris. Residential, I say no worries for us because it's uh, probably the lowest uh, risk of obsolescence and uh, of course issue for, uh, I would say, affordable housing, etc. But uh, it was already there. And at the end, the hotel, like <laughs> the, the, the most difficult part because we are sure that people will come back, tourism, to, 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 we, we need to, to travel, to play, to, to, to discover new, uh, uh, new countries, etc. But the, the, the main question is the, the, the speed of the recovery. And do you think the real estate industry is nimble enough to react to this sudden need for more flexibility? Yes, I think it's, uh, but it's, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's set a huge issue. It means that we are uh, uh, long-term, uh, uh, the, the, the return on investment, uh, it's a long-term uh, question for us. So it's, uh, it's an in, in industry where you need a lot of equity, a lot of capital to, to be deployed. So uh, the major issue today is our cycle are shorter and probably the need of flexibility is, means also shorter contract, for example. Uh, it means that you have to be better uh, to, to, to keep your clients, but it's the same for the hotel business. Huh? If clients are not happy, they don't come back. So it will become the, the also, for me, the, the, the question for offices. If people are not happy, they will not stay with you. So you have to bring something more, not only a building, but also a, a, a relationship and to build on that uh, very strongly. And it does seem there will be a bit of dispersing of office locations to other places, as you mentioned, that this is quite bad news for the likes of some central business districts. Or I, I live, for example, near Canary Wharf in London, and there are just huge hulking office buildings that are nearly nearly empty. So what do we do with those spaces? And is this shakeout quite dangerous for the office industry? I, I would say after there is a... Uh, I don't think it will be uh, like this in one, uh, in one minute, but uh, of course it's an issue and we have to think about uh, how we can transform those buildings so it creates new opportunity. And of course there is a question around the value, uh, how we are able, uh, or the organization, the, the, the investor, we are able to, uh, to follow these trends and to, uh, to deliver, I would say, uh, new products. Uh, but it's a major deal uh, for sure. I don't mean that for me those districts are, are dead tomorrow, but it's exactly what happened, for example, in La Défense, is the way you have to recreate a, a life and a city. For me, uh, it's definitely the end of uh, a pure mono-asset district and versus a piece of cities with, uh, uh, where you can find uh, uh, cultural experience, you can also, uh, you can work, of course, but you can meet, you can enjoy, you can entertain, etc. So, so for me, it's this idea, and we have to look at those, uh, and probably it will accelerate the trends, and we have to find a way, both public and private sector, to, uh, to push the transformation of those districts. Yeah, it will have to be a holistic approach. Uh, really. Now let's turn to Gregory. Uh, now you are with Club Med, and obviously challenge is a pretty, uh, is a, is a pretty small word for the, big, for the big issues facing the hospitality sector at this moment in time. So how, how is Club Med coping with that and, and are there any bright sparks that you can see? Thanks, Courtney. Uh, the first thing is, as for once we have an audience, I would like to do one little thing which is a bit of an interactive exercise. Who in the audience did go for holiday this summer? Can you raise your hands? Okay, nearly everybody. Was it good? Can you raise your hands? Good, but that's the good news you were looking for. And for you, I must say that this is the best part of your year. Of your year. <laughs> the next thing, if we speak about tourism, a bit about Club Med, but tourism. The first thing is, for a while, there was no tourism. And that's very new. That was extremely challenging on leaders. There was no visibility on what was coming next. Where you could go, when, with which constraints which for leaders has been an exercise of adapting all the time, extremely intense. Then tourism developed this summer. First, nationally, 
than regionally and not further than regionally. This tourism was with constraints, sanitary constraints. I must say that these constraints are our day-to-day -day business in hospitality, but they've been pushed further with a, a big issue, which is how do you make it lively as a club net with sanitary constraints. I believe that this has been a success on our side, but this sanitary necessity will remain as a long-term trend, not with the mask and everything, but people are more aware about sanitary issues and it will remain in the hotel industry as something that's gonna be uh, in the future. Now another learning, it is this summer we had leisure tourism. There was no business tourism. I do believe that leisure to me, tourism will come back, as you said, Olivier, it will come back. The question is when business tourism will come back also. But with what we have experienced over the last six months, it will come back differently. And those players who are absolutely focused on business tourism will have to restructure, to adapt. Which, in terms of the CD, because I'm speaking about holiday, but the subject is your bon uh, has got an impact. There will be bankruptcies, there will be things to restructure, and there will think, be things to rethink for the future, uh, and probably opportunities. Now that's the short term and a bit of long term on business tourism. Um, the point I would like to make is try and see a bit longer term on tourism and how this longer term may affect cities eventually. The, bi the biggest topic are polemics about tourism over the last few years, if you remember before COVID, was about the carbon impact of tourism. The flight chain, for instance, or the mass tourism. This is something that at one stage will have to be dealt with. There is two options. Either you travel with the winds on one side, or you stop traveling. I personally don't believe in either of them, as you said, Olivier. Uh, and for instance, because stopping traveling is like stopping smoking. You know that traveling may hurt the planet or smoking may hurt yourself, but when you do it, it's extremely good and you don't feel that you're killing yourself. So I don't think we'll stop traveling, but I think it's gonna change. I think we will travel less often, but longer. And that's where COVID has got a very specific role in all this. Because the COVID period is acting or has acted as a catalyst on two major things that I think will change tourism or answer this, um, this subject for the future of carbon impact of tourism. First is home office. Second is home teaching. Home office is a success. We all know that it cannot be long term, it cannot be all the time, but it can be. My point of view is that it will evolve partly to vacation office. Now imagine for your next uh, winter holidays, instead of going one week and having your kids one week at home uh, idle, you go two weeks, but one week you work from the distance. Then you can do this in February, you can do this in April, and July and August. This provided, of course, that you, got, you have a solution for your kids, and that's where some players can bring something like Club Med, but that also has a future impact on cities and urban development because instead of having Paris empty during seven, eight weeks per year, what you will have is Paris empty during 15 to 12 to 20 weeks eventually. So how does the city adapt to this emptiness during the periods where people will be in a position to work from their vacation place away from the city? And the second element, which will change things also, is home teaching. Imagine now if kids can be teached from the distance on their holiday place, on their vacation place, on another place than the city or the school, which we have experienced during the lockdown. It will completely free the vacation or the holiday or the resort business because you could imagine people staying away for a longer period of time, which will have an extremely positive impact 
environmentally, socially, because you would free from something that is a stupidity, which, will, which is the holiday seasonality. Today, tourism is building infrastructure for French people for two months during summer, two weeks during April, two weeks uh, during the festive weeks. The rest of the time, half empty, half plain empty, and that doesn't make any environmental sense, any economical sense. So if you can free yourself from going to work, to office to work part of the year, and if you can free yourself from going to school for teaching for part of the year, you kill seasonality, you better use your touristic assets, you help the cities because you lower down the pressure of people. Let's say if there is 10% less people in Paris all year long, you will feel it on the streets, you will feel it on the, uh, on the suburbs, on the everything, and it will bring something new and fresh to, your, to our society. Uh, as Olivier was saying, it's not tomorrow, but if we want to see the long-term evolution, I do believe that this is part of it. It, it sounds like what we're talking about, whether it's from offices or tourism, is a, is a spreading out amongst places, amongst, you know, spreading out the season, spreading out the, the location, spreading out the offices. So that could be a potential upside of the crisis. In terms of segments in tourism, how is luxury um, reacting and performing as opposed to budget or, let's say, normal travel? Well, there is, if we take the Parisian uh, example, luxury segment has had no tourism for a big part of the year uh, because it was and that's that's the the back part of the uh, partial unemployment uh, it became at one stage more profitable to be closed than to be open so better be closed because we can be reimbursed the staff expenses um, what went well is peripheric tourism uh, some region in france welcoming usually french people went well did well Places usually used to welcome international foreigners and uh, travelers went wrong, like Paris, for instance. So regional tourism, not city tourism for the summer, um, and more accessible because French people, for most of them, uh, unfortunately, do not have as high revenues and capabilities in tourism as the international of this world that are traveling to France usually. Yes, yeah, so and most of Europe's been deprived, um, thanks to COVID, of American travelers coming and spending a ton of money in France in particular. Um, so that will all have its impact. So let's turn uh, to Laurent. Now, from an investment perspective, what are the implications? I mean, in investors typically don't like uncertainty, and they've got more, more of it right now than they, they could possibly fathom. So what do we do? So, so you're right. There are a lot of uncertainty. Uh, uh, for the time being, and as long as uh, this crisis, well, we're speaking about uh, the restaurants, etc. but it's still ongoing, that's the reality, so there are still a lot to, to, to be learned. But um, I, I would say, generally speaking, uh, th the crisis has just acted as a catalyst or an accelerator of trends which were already there. Uh, we're speaking about uh, home office. It's not something which appeared uh, suddenly uh, when uh, the lockdown was, uh, was imposed in, in, in different countries. Uh, it was already there, there was a lot of reservation, how it works, do we deal with a lot of freedom. It has been a massive real-time experience, people now acknowledge that it works, so we know that it will probably be a big push on, on that front. So the, the office sector will be challenged on, on, that, uh, on that basis. Not necessarily because uh, there will be no more office in the future, uh, we need still, uh, we still need to have an office to gather people, to create the culture of the company. The lockdown is okay because most of the people know with each other, so they can work remotely and they limit the social contact, but it cannot be sustainable. So office will be needed, probably different type of offices, uh, which was already, I would say, for the new built uh, product addressing this kind of need, probably more difficult or obsolescence for older building will be probably increased uh, significantly. Uh, so, so the question is more about the pace of adaptation of the market to the change in demand. And real estate is not the most flexible uh, type of asset to adapt. And it's not just about the physical characteristic of the building. I was hearing uh, uh, with a lot of attention in Hidalgo, but it's also about regulation. I think the, the cities need also to accept that they, they need to provide a very flexible environment. 
we were deciding that this part should be an office uh, area. They, they need to be able to change very quickly the use uh, 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 of the asset in order to keep alive the city and not uh, empty zones uh, as it may appear. So I would say when we look to the geothermal sectors, it's the pace of change for, for the office and, and, uh, and, um, and the retail sector, based on trends which were already there. Uh, the, the surprise, in fact, the, the asset class for me, which was having a significant uh, tailwind and was caught by surprise on this crisis, is the, the hospitality sector. Very clearly, global travel, the trends were very positive. Uh, so, so this one, I, I agree with what uh, has been said that long-term prospects should be still good. The big question is when people will start to, uh, coming back to a more normal and if the demand uh, will change. So I was hearing very, uh, with, with a lot of interest, uh, the, the, the views uh, here because uh, that's a big question mark when you're trying to forecast what is the right place and the right type of product you need to, 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 to have as an investment for the future. I, it comes back as well to what the initial question you were asking about the teams. I, I think the, the investment management um, uh, job is evolving because the asset and the underlying asset are also the requirements are, are, are different. Uh, I would say so some years ago, we were just about using space, providing the space to a tenant once the space was let, no more have our business. Uh, today, it's becoming much more operational. You need completely to understand what are the needs of your end users, what is the product you want to offer, how you adapt it. So it's much more intensive. You need to have people who have a much broader skill set than, uh, than, than before. So that's part of the transformation of the industry and it will be probably significantly increased uh, in the future. People were doing 10 years ago shopping centers feeling that uh, retail is a safe place to be and it has been for a very long time a very safe place to be. Now they need to really think about the product, how they attract footfall in order to keep their, their, uh, their, their tenants or partnering with uh, your tenants. That's a complete different skill set than just using space. Uh, hospitality, the, many people were still in hotels not thinking about what is the underlying business which are the client, leisure, business traveler, how it can be impacted, etc. They have no choice. They, they need to understand what is going on in the hotel because the tenants are not in good shape. That's the reality. Their business is, is suffering a lot. So that's our part of the changes we were yeah, seeing. Yeah, there's some disparity in the different segments in terms of their challenges and recovery prospects, but how do we see things regionally as well? Are you bullish on any particular um, markets where you see investment opportunities? So unfortunately, uh, I use also to, you, to, to, to work on a lot on portfolio diversification. This time that didn't, didn't work, it didn't work at all. So the asset class has been heard the same way in all territories, or nearly. So um, uh, I don't think that it's more a question of territory than asset class. Uh, clearly, um, the, the, the the logistic sector, the reshuffling of all uh, the uh, distribution uh, is having still uh, a, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, tailwind. And it might be part of the solution also for some of the retail and we're coming back about the use of uh, the building uh, within the city is one of the challenges is the last mile delivery. And last mile delivery is the most costly because you're in dense urban uh, areas, so th th there will be probably some, um, let's say, uh, way to address smartly this, this through probably a bit less of retail needs within the cities or potentially a bit of less of office needs in, in, uh, inside the city. Uh, data center, uh, that, that's a no-brainer to go to us uh, already having a, uh, a very strong trend. Uh, it is clearly a big, um, let's say winner of, of what is happening. Uh, residential has shown its, resi its resilience, uh, but it's not without any question. We are speaking about uh, home working will change the, the, the location needs, uh, because if you're commuting only two days a, a week, do you need exactly to be on the same place? Uh, people who have experience working the lockdown in small apartment might prefer to have a bit more of a, of uh, space and uh, even if it has a price of having a longer travel. So I think that, that's the question mark. 
Suddenly, urban dwellers desperately need a balcony or a garden that maybe didn't bother so much about before. I'm curious about the impact on, uh, when we think about office space, about co-working spaces. Um, and I wonder, uh, Olivia, you might have a view on this. I mean, with this new need for flexibility, um, that, that should lend itself to um, increased attractiveness for co-working spaces because they are kind of built on flexible leases. At the same time, there's, I suppose, a, a health and safety issue of bringing, you know, disparate groups of people together. You know, for, 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 for us, what I see in the market is co-working is a little bit, uh, not exactly the right word, it's much more, I would say, of flexible offices because when I look at uh, uh, the offer provided by all the players in the market, it's much more a dedicated office with a, a wide range of services and full flexibility in the contract in terms of duration and also the capacity for certain players to, uh, to keep your, uh, your culture and to privatize your own offices. Uh, and for me, uh, for sure, it will reinforce the attractivity because, uh, uh, as I said, it's a combo today. And uh, when, I, when, I, uh, when I meet some, I would say, executives, I say, okay, we are thinking about remote working, from home or for a third place, it's for sure something we will do tomorrow. The question is one day, two day, three day per, per week, and how we manage the organization efficiency. The second point is uh, we need an office, uh, in, I would say, in hard. We, we lease or um, we let or we are owner, uh, doesn't matter, but we have to have our own office. And after, there is a part of flexibility for secondary location, for example, or for a part of the needs we have, maybe one, one day per week, two day per week, and um, when all the people are coming to the office, for example, we need more meeting rooms, we need a no, more workstation for a project and so on, and we have this possibility to, to have the flexibility. And, uh, and for me, I, it doesn't mean that it will become the, 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 the sole model, I think. Huh? Uh, we will have always both longer contract and, uh, and flexibility. Also longer contract because flexibility has a cost, so it's more expensive for the company, but uh, and, and longer contract, they can, have the benefit of more incentives, and it's a, so it's a balance between the, the, the three solutions. And Paul, from a talent perspective, uh, I guess flexibility is important too, and, and how crucial is it now in terms of to attract the top talent, what should companies be trying to propose and offer them in terms of flexibility about where they work and what the facilities are like? Of course, this is definitely a, a, a new parameter in the offer and in the perspective of developing the, the, the new leaders, uh, giving them flexibility. It's also a challenge regarding management rules and management culture because you have a lot of pressure, and especially in the real estate sector, on the, on, on the team leaders to, to make the, the new generation grow and, and, and be able to really develop themselves where we, it is more difficult to do when you have more flexibility also in the younger generation. So the challenge of leading teams in the real estate sector is all, already very, very strong. And if you add the flexibility in the younger generation, that is another challenge to the, on, on the shoulders of the, of, the, of, the, of the team leaders. So we must be very careful there. And I think from the top and from the governance of the companies, there must be a specific concern there to give to the team leaders the capacity to really do their job to, to make the team grow. This is a specific challenge which is uh, going out, out of the, the crisis. And do you think they're overall meeting this challenge well? Uh, I think at the end, the, the, the corporate companies, the real estate companies who, are, who will have a, the better view on that, the capacity to really, um, let's say, implement a new strategy for developing the talents and the leadership will be the winners. Thank you. And I, I want to just come back to tourism for a moment as we get close to uh, ready to take some take question from the audience. And Gregory, what can the public sector do to support the tourism industry at such a vulnerable time? What what actually helps? I'm I'm I'm, I'm afraid what would help is is not in their capability, which is visibility uh, and constants in the direction, uh, considering all the unknown things about how we're going to de deal with the, uh, the COVID. It's very difficult for them to, uh, to bring this. Um, that's the long uh, histories. 
investing in infrastructure and in transportation infrastructure, investing in properties, and that's what the Caisse des Dépôts in France is uh, planning to do, uh, and that also works because they can take some project that normal investors may not take, but would help the territories. That's definitely helpful. Uh, but I would say consistency in what we want hoteliers or hospitality to be doing in their place. Because without consistency, we can't plan, we can't operate, we can't satisfy the guests, and we can't reassure the guests on the fact that it's okay to, uh, to go for a, a place. Thank you, and I think we'll take in a, in a minute or two a question from the audience, but I, I would just like to return to Laurent and what do you see at this moment in time as the most underappreciated or under the radar investment opportunity? Maybe you don't want to tell us, maybe it's your That's secret. Um, I don't think that there is a, a, a huge discrepancy. I think there have been some asset class which has been uh, uh, not fully considered uh, in the past, and, um, and I think that we have been pushing a lot on it, which is about double housing. Uh, there is a conviction that uh, th th there is, uh, and not affordable housing to make a, 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 a huge return when you are able to raise the rent to a, a, a top market uh, to top market level. It's, it's really about risk return. The affordable housing is, is really providing basic needs to the population. Uh, the, 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 the returns will be relatively low, but uh, the cash flow will be extremely resilient. So I've been pushing a lot on that. Uh, and, um, and this one was not a big target, I would say, uh, so far. And, uh, there have been a lot of uh, willingness to go into the residential market, but most of the time it was to upgrade significantly uh, badly maintained uh, assets or under-rented situation in order to extract a lot of value, uh, which creates a lot of tension, because that's the asset class which is politically extremely sensitive. Uh, so also being able to provide the right type of product to maintain the mixed city in cities, I think it, it is a very interesting tool. And it doesn't work for all type of player. You need to, to, to have the, the, the right type of, type of capital in being able to, to pursue this kind of uh, strategy. Thank you. And I want to see, do we have a, a question from the audience yet? The answer is yes. Yes, let's have it. <laughs> Uh, so th there's, a, there's a question, um, how to find the good balance between socialization and teleworking, remote working, how to redesign existing places to turn them into more flexible buildings and places? Who wants to answer this question? I, I can answer about the, the, the building. It's, a, it's clearly an issue and it's the, the question, uh, as Laurent said, of uh, the obsolescence and the acceleration of obsolescence. When, when, we, when we are dealing with the flexibility, it means uh, I had a discussion yesterday, uh, a very simple example. The, example, the, 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 the guy was, uh, was asking, say, I want to put my meeting rooms everywhere in the building without any constraints, and I want to be able to change it each year if needed. So for us, it's a main issue because you have to uh, probably spend a little bit more money in, uh, when you are designing the building to, to, to keep this flexibility, and, uh, and it means also uh, uh, the density in the building. You have to be to, to have a larger staircase, staircases. You have to, uh, to, to, to provide also the question of sanitary measure, the, the fresh air everywhere, the possibility to, uh, uh, to, to cut all the system if needed and to open the window, uh, all those topics, and, uh, and about the flexibility, physical flexibility, it's increased uh, technical constraints, but it's possible to do it. It means that we have to transform existing building, and in our project today, we have to integrate this new uh, paradigm uh, in our design. For the flexibility in the contract, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated because it's, a, uh, I would say, real estate investors are looking for regular return, and so the volatility of the, the return is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, the main issue. So uh, again, of course, you have to reinforce the attractivity of your product, but uh, you have to mitigate also, uh, it's our perspective for Covivio, and to mitigate the, 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 the risk between long-term contract and to have, a, I would say, well-balanced uh, risk between long-term contract and, and shorter, shorter contract with uh, co-working, for example. 
any other questions? Yeah, and there's another question for, for all the panelists. Uh, do you have a key relevant uh, or, or several key relevant actions to lead and, uh, and to, to enable mobility for living, working, traveling, socializing? Who wants to answer this question? The question of mobility. Mobility, and important as, as commuting patterns and everything changes. Who yeah. has some keys to that? I think Gregory uh, raised that with the mobility regarding uh, tourism and, and leisure uh, activities, but uh, I think for, for the cities, uh, it's more on your side, I guess. So, so I, I think uh, for, for um, uh, the mobility, there will be changes. So we are mentioning uh, uh, the way we are interacting between people. My personal experience during the lockdown is that to a certain extent, level of interaction with remote teams has been much better. Uh, where I felt initially that I would need to be uh, in each territory, uh, we have teams on a very regular basis, maybe uh, once every two to three weeks. Uh, this need would be clearly much less because we, we have been using that now naturally tools which enable a good level of interaction uh, with, uh, with, uh, with our teams. Um, so that's w one thing. The other on uh, the city that said itself and the built environment, uh, there have been a lot of discussion regarding density. And so obviously uh, looking for uh, lower density given uh, the, the consequence of the, the, the pandemic. I strongly believe that we have no choice than the choice of density for two reasons, which are economic and, uh, and ecological uh, reason. Uh, economic because if you want really to provide to people good infrastructure, social infrastructure, health infrastructure, you have no choice than to have enough people in a very limited uh, uh, space. So the second is the footprint of real estate. The, the less dense environment, the, the broader use of, uh, the, the, uh, of land you are doing and which create other issues regarding uh, uh, biodiversity, impact of human activity on, 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 uh, on um, our environment. So density will be important, uh, and this density with flexibility of use should enable to increase the use of, uh, of uh, cycles. Uh, I think the renting model versus ownership model is also uh, a big topic because you, don't, you can't easily manage uh, high mobility and home ownership. Uh, so that's part also of the equation. You need to be able to, to move uh, very easily. So th there are a number of topics which will be evolving, but it's involving so many different players that uh, aligning everyone to, to, to make this uh, happen in a, in a, in a let's say, um, efficient way is, is always a challenge. Um, I suppose for you, Gregory, mobility is, is not so much moving around in the city, but longer, you know, longer haul mobility, Traveling and people being world, able yes. to travel. Um, what, what would help there? Again, it probably comes back to the infrastructure and I suppose um, uh, ease of uh, visa facilitation and all those, all those bureaucratic, bureaucratic things as well. Uh, I, I would say, as I said before, that travel will be less often, but longer. Same for uh, commuting. Huh? Maybe you're not gonna commute for uh, 30 minutes every day, but you're gonna commute for one hour every other day. So if you think everything this way, even long, distance travel, how do you adapt to the fact that people may travel less often but longer time? Uh, and, and all this, I think we are at the beginning of it. So uh, to say what the authorities sh should do, uh, what type of investment they should do is a bit premature probably, but that's definitely the mindset in which we should, uh, we should aim. Then of course, uh, short term, you ask me what authorities could do to help. It's open borders that would help definitely for tourism and for traveling. And I think having taken a flight of, over the last few months with the mask and everything, it goes okay. So there is no reason for closing the borders for this reason and for not traveling. Um, and facilitate whatever type of uh, uh, flows you can have and whatever type of bureaucracy you can have. Of course, that's been the case for. A big thank you to uh, our excellent 
panelists and giving, for sharing your insights and for all of you for your attention and, and traveling to come to a conference, whether that was from across Paris or further abroad. Um, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the show and take care and stay safe. Merci beaucoup. Je demande de les applaudir. Thank you. Tous les cinq, Courtney, Olivier, Paul, Grégory okay, et Courtney. Laurent.